Well, you made it. Here we are, chapter 11. We're going to be talking about some introductions and conclusions to your speeches, how to prepare a good one, why you need one in the first place. And uh, so let's just jump right on in. Opening and closings are critical to a good public speech. In fact, we kind of get this idea from the legal realm where lawyers will tell you that most of their cases that they try hinge on the beginning and the end of their opening arguments and their closing arguments. And so the same principle kind of holds true when it comes to public speaking. Just like a lawyer is addressing the jury and their opening and closing is, is where they win or lose their cases, you will win or lose your audience in a public speech from the way that you open it and the way that you close it. So hopefully you can see, even from the get-go, we're talking about a re really seriously overlooked section of public speaking and preparation. So we're going to take a look at it today and see what they're all about and what we need to do to get better at them. Uh, the introduction of a speech is here for two purposes. They're going to gain your audience's attention, and you're going to gain their interest. And that's the two most important parts of an introduction. Because, look, if you don't grab your listeners immediately, th they might let their thoughts and their eyes dwell on all kinds of other things other than what you're talking about and what you're doing. So you have to use attention grabbers. And, and the textbook calls these things attention material. And we're, we're going to look at some of the different types. Everyone loves to hear a, a good story. I love a story. Hint, hint, I love stories. So... Maybe in your speeches you should include some, but everybody loves stories. Think about it. Uh, we tell stories. Think about Jesus speaking uh, and, and teaching in the Scripture. He uses parables all of the time. Our bodies are so conditioned to love stories that when we lay down at night, we continue to play out stories in our head. They're called dreams. Um, there's different kinds of stories. You can use real-life stories, and you know that could be like an account of an automobile accident and you're using it to illustrate the dangers of talking on a cell phone while driving. And then there's hypothetical stories, and these are imaginary scenarios about what would happen if, you know, what would happen if a person drank water that was not pure. Uh, so there's different kinds of stories that you can relate. Another thing you can do is you can simply just ask a question. And asking a question can be in a very effective way. Uh, to intrigue your listener and encourage them to think about what you're talking about in your subject matter. And there's two different kinds of questions here. Again, we've got the rhetorical question. This is a question that you really don't want or really expect listeners to answer overtly by raising their hands or saying something out loud. You don't want it. Uh, and they're good to use. What's What's really interesting, though, is when you use a rhetorical question and someone chooses the answer, it, it usually creates an awkward moment. But hopefully most people understand the difference between something you want an answer to or not. So rhetorical questions are the answers that you really, you're really you not really looking for. You just want to trigger their curiosity. Basically, you want to challenge them to think about your topic and what's going to come up. And then we've got these other ones called overt response questions. And for these, it's it's a little bit different. You want your audience to actually actively engage and do something in response to what you've asked. Maybe that's raising their hand or maybe saying the answer out loud. Uh, you know, you may use a, a question like, by a show of hands, how many of you guys have donated blood in the past year? Well, you've told them to actually do something, raise their hand. So that's a overt response question. Now, here's a question that one speaker used as an opener before. If you want to know whether a couple in a romantic relationship will stay together or break up, the most accurate predictions come from, well, which one do you think? Who can best predict the breakup? Is it the couple, his friends, or her friends? I'll give you a moment to think about it. If I had Jeopardy music, I'd have it playing right here. So who can best predict the breakup? If you answered C... You're correct. It's her friends. In fact, researchers at Purdue University have found that her friends are much better at predicting the outcome of a relationship than actually the couple themselves. So, you know, this kind of stuff grabs interest. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to know who can predict a breakup in a relationship? Uh, so you're gaining the audience's interest. You're gaining their attention. 
you can also make a provocative statement. Uh, one way to grab attention is to say something that is just extremely kind of out there, not, not rude or crude, but something that is different, out of the norm. One student actually began a speech one time by asking uh, this, this statement. They were talking about human cloning, and they said, I have seen a human clone with my own eyes, and so have you. And she went on to quote a biologist who says, identical twins are more identical than cloned organism is to a donor. Uh, she explained, you know, that biologically identical twins are really, they're clones of one another. And so that would definitely get me thinking, have I really seen a clone? Where have I seen a clone? Provocative statements can grab attention and interest to your audience. You can also do quotations. Uh, have a good uh, citation of a quotation. Look at Anne Morrow Lindbergh's quote here. Good communication is as stimulating as black coffee and just as hard to sleep after. If you start off a speech like that, you've got our attention. You've got our interest. You can also arouse some curiosity at the beginning of a speech. Uh, a speaker displayed this photo and said, what's going on here? You know, and, and think about it. What do you see here? Are you seeing an argument between two people? Are you seeing the guy saying she thinks she's right and she's got her eyes rolled and he always thinks he's right? Is this an argument? Uh, you know, you've piqued the curiosity of your audience. Um and this particular speaker kind of launched into a discussion on how couples can have disagreements without being hurtful. And so this picture is very effective in this. It's also a good intriguing story, I'm sure, behind it that will build curiosity. Also, you can provide visual aids or some sort of a demonstration. Let's say you were doing a speech on uh, art projects for children. Just put this photo up there, this cool kid with paint all over his hands. It, it gets people's attention. It's nice. It's bright. The colors grab your attention. You're, you're looking at the kid with paint all over his hands. And if you're a parent like I am, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, please don't let him be on the couch. But this definitely will get people's attention. You also can use an incentive um, to listen. Give people an incentive to listen. A lot of people, when they get into a speech, especially if it's a, a topic that they may find, well, let's just be honest, boring uh, of some sort, like CPR or something like that. Um, a lot of people go into these speeches with these couple of questions on their mind. They ask, what's in it for me? And why should I pay attention to this speech? Now, obviously, they're not thinking it in their brain in those terms, but really they are subconsciously asking themselves this question, what's in it for me? If I'm going to give you 10 minutes of my time, what's in it for me? And, and why should I be paying attention to you? And, and these people need to be given an incentive to listen to the entire speech. So whenever possible, if you can, state explicitly why listeners are going to benefit by listening to you, by listening to the whole speech. It's not enough to simply say, say things like, my speech is uh, very important. Well, obviously it is, or you wouldn't be up there. You have to show them how their topic relates to them, how it relates to their lives, how, how it relates to their own best interest. If you listen to me, you're going to gain something from this. Think about this one here. you got this photo of, of CPR. And if you were going to give a talk on CPR, you may say something like this. All of you may someday have a friend or a loved one that collapses from a heart attack right in front of your eyes. And if you know CPR, you might be able to save that person's life. Now think about that. If you open a speech with that, to me that answers all those questions. Oh, so if I listen to you on how to do CPR, I have the ability to possibly one day save a life if I'm put in that situation? Well, you talk about you got my attention now. Now, after the attention material comes the orienting material. Uh, you want to gain the attention and the interest, and then after that, you've got another important goal, and this goal is to give the audience an orientation this is a, a clear sense of what your speech is going to be about and any other kind of information that the audience is going to need in order to understand and absorb your ideas. The textbook uses the term orienting material to refer to this part of the introduction. Now, the orienting material, think of it as a road map, and it's going to make it easier for the listeners to stay with you on this journey you're about to take them on. They're not going to get lost and they're not going to get confused because you've clearly marked out where you're going. 
during the orienting material, uh, some of the things you can do is give background information. Maybe you need to give some definitions, maybe an explanation about what you're going to be talking about. Think about those kind of things. Anything that's going to help your listeners understand your speech better. For instance, if you're, you're giving a speech on gun control, you would definitely need to define the term gun control. Are we talking about banning of all guns or are you just talking about the registration of guns? Big difference, isn't it? Or, or maybe if you're talking about gun control, uh, are you talking about simply hitting the target you're aiming at? You need to define it. You've got to give the people an orientation of where you're going. It's almost like you're setting the parameters of what you're going to talk about. You just let them know we're talking about this. We're not necessarily talking about the other. During the orienting material, you can establish your credibility. Uh, think about this person here. If they were going to give a speech on skydiving, uh, they may want to let the audience know, hey, I've went on five different skydiving experiences. Well, automatically, I know that you know more about this than I do. It's not bragging. It's basically a way to let us know that you're speaking from experience, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know what you're talking about. So establish your credibility during the orienting material portion of the introduction. And in the introduction, you need to preview the body of the speech. I want you to think about this in contrast to the rubric that is uploaded on the, the website. You need to preview the body of your speech. It's part of our rubric, too. Um, this is going to help your audience listen to what you have to say very intelligently. And they're going to be able to pay attention and know where they're going. It's kind of like giving them that roadmap with the itinerary marked not only here we're go this is where we're going but we'll stop here for a restroom break we'll stop here for lunch you would do that on a road trip so do that in a speech tell them this is where we're going but here's the stops we're going to make point one point two point three so here's some guidelines when you're putting together your introductions here's some guidelines that i would like to see you follow the first is this you should never and let me emphasize, never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> prepare your introduction first. Because if you don't work on the body, which is supposed to be the first thing that you work on, if you don't work on the body and have it kind of fleshed out to know where your what your main points are going to be, how can you ever introduce it? I mean, you can't introduce something that you haven't created yet. But yet, in speaking, we have a tendency to go jump right into how we're going to introduce something without even putting together what we're going to talk about. So remember this, don't prepare your introduction first. That's a no-no. Another thing a lot of people do is they just kind of blow through the introduction. They spend like five or 10 seconds on it, but that's not right. You shouldn't be too brief. Make it simple, make it easy to follow, but avoid making it too short. Your audience needs time to get into the groove of your speech. They get to, they need to get in that groove of how you're going to flow. And if the introduction is too short, it may go by way too fast for the listeners to absorb it, and you don't want them to be lost. Another good um, guideline for an introduction is to have an obvious tie-in to the body of the speech. That could be a story that's going to illustrate some of your points later, a fact, um, some kind of quote that you're going to bring in and re-kind re of visit in the body of your speech. And another thing is never apologize. Let's say you were put onto the spot and, uh, you know, they called you the day before and they want you to talk on this subject and you agree and you show up. You should never get up and apologize and say things like, man, I, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, but no, well, you've decreased your audience's confidence in you right from the get go. So never apologize for lack of preparation or lack of time to prepare. Don't do that. It lessens your credibility. And you don't want that in public speaking at all. So let's jump to the very end. Let's talk about conclusions. What are they all about? Remember, those lawyers, they say the introduction and the conclusion are the two parts of an argument that, that are the most important. And the two parts of our speech that is most important. Conclusions come uh, at the end. And if you are like most speakers, you do not put enough time into concluding. Think about the speeches you've already recorded or you've already made in class. I want you to think about those. Did you prepare for the end? When you got to the end of your speech, were you surprised? 
were you on a roll until you got to the very end and you're thinking, how do I wrap this thing up? And you began to stumble over your words. Conclusions must be prepared. You must organize them in the outline. You must know where you're going. Uh, so here's some guidelines for that. You need to signal the end. You need to always let your audience know what's up and that the end is near. Um, Verbal signals are what we kind of use to let everybody know verbally. Uh, We use transition statements like, in conclusion, I would like to say. That lets your audience know that the end is near, that you're kind of landing the airplane, um, and that we're about to be done. You'll notice this a lot of times uh, in churches. (laughs) You'll see a a pastor do this as he's preaching, and he'll say, finally, or in conclusion. That's about the time everybody starts closing their Bibles and zipping them up. It's a habit we have. I don't know why we do it. But pastors are a good example of what a verbal conclusion kind of looks like. Uh, We say in conclusion when we're getting to the end of a sermon and the end of a speech. You can also give a nonverbal signal that the end is near. You can alter the tone of your voice, maybe make a a cool facial expression that lets everybody know you're raising your eyebrows. Maybe you make a gesture that all people use when they wish to convey a sense of completion, like a hand and a fist or something like that. These things are needed. You want your audience to know that they are they're coming to the end of the speech, that they need to be paying attention. Summaries are coming up, and main points will be rehashed so they don't miss them. And we'll look at that in a moment. Well, as I just said, in a moment, summarizing key ideas is where you want to want to take your conclusion. Every conclusion needs a summary. Okay, you heard me right. Look at your, look at your rubrics. Not only do you preview the main points in the introduction, you must summarize in the conclusion. It's just like a lawyer. Remember, they're summarized. This lawyer here is summarizing her her argument to the jury. Uh, You go back and you've got one last chance to drive home your key ideas. The three points that you just made, you're going to re-go over them. You're going to summarize them so that your points are left with a lasting impression in your audience's mind that they can take home with them. Another good idea is to reinforce your central idea with a clincher. Uh, You want to close your your speech with a clincher, and and a clincher is basically a statement that reinforces your central idea. It's a graceful finale, basically, that, that drives home this main theme of your entire speech. So end with a clincher. Here's some examples of good clinchers. Maybe you can go back and cite a quotation again. A quotation can be a very effective clincher. If you do one, though, make sure it's really brief. Don't, don't expound on it. Just use a short quotation that you happen to find. Another type of clincher would be an issue, uh, you issuing an appeal or a challenge. If you've been talking about what it's like to donate blood, then perhaps you can close with a a strong appeal for every listener to take action. Hey, the blood mobile is going to be here next Tuesday on campus. I encourage you to go out and donate blood. And hopefully you've talked about how many lives you can save. Just uh, issue that appeal to them. Uh, You can also give an illustration. You can give a speech when you're closing a speech like on rodeo uh, go back and and talk about the excitement of uh, of rodeo of how it is like riding an untamed horse or something like that give give that illustration you know i love stories you can also do this and this is really cool you can refer back to the introduction as a clincher uh, we all know uh, or maybe you guys don't, but there was a very effective public speaker who used to have a radio television, uh, not television, a radio show. He would do a news program, five, six minutes on uh, on usually country music radio stations. His name was Paul Harvey. And Paul Harvey would always start off his news broadcast with a really cool story. But he would kind of bring it to kind of an end, but leave the door open to come back. And he'd go through another three or four minutes of news stories of the day. And then at the very end, as a clincher, he would come back and he would go, and now rest the rest of the story. And he would finish the story that he kind of left hanging at the beginning. It was very effective. Everyone looked forward to it. He had one every every day that he did the news. So you can always refer to the introduction. Take the conclusion and go back to the beginning and refer to something that you mentioned at the get-go. 
So here's your some guidelines for the conclusions. The first thing is, is don't drag out that ending. Oh, goodness, don't do that. Don't tell your audience you're coming in for the landing, that the speech is over, and just like a plane that comes near the runway, don't hit the gas and take off again, okay? Uh, be brief. Stick to your plan. If you forgot to say something in the body of your speech, now is not the time to bring in new information. You're closing the speech, so don't drag it out. Also, don't end weekly. If you close your speech with statements like, well, I guess that's about all I've got to say, <laughs> and if you're really nonchalant and your voice is very unenthusiastic, you are encouraging your listeners to downgrade your entire speech. You must end with confidence. If you end with confidence, your audience will be confident in what you just said. Again, don't end your speech apologetically. Uh, don't don't apologize for anything. When you do that, it makes you look incompetent. It makes you look weak. Do not apologize. And the last thing is never bring in new main points. I kind of alluded to that in point number one. Uh, it's okay. Um, some people think it's, uh, like I said, if you miss a point in the body, don't go back and hit it. Never bring in new main points. It's okay to bring in like new fresh material in your conclusion, but it has to tie into something you've already said. In fact, it's actually a really good idea to bring in something fresh at the end, as long as it ties back into your points, as long as it doesn't constitute a new point in your speech, then do it. Uh, you want something fresh on the table, but don't don't bring in like, oh yeah, point number five is, no, don't do that. That's not what conclusions are for. Don't forget, these are two of the most overlooked parts of public speaking. We all have our main points and our main theme we want to get across, but if you don't introduce it and you don't conclude it successfully, you will lose a lot of credibility. And the thing is, is we want to be the best that we can. So let's practice introducing and let's practice conclusions.